cara. Good afternoon and welcome back to the Texas Soccer Summit presented by the Striker Texas. Hope everybody's been enjoying all the great panels throughout the week. We've got more to come, uh, but right now I'm really excited to do Youth Girls Path to Pro. Uh, my name is Chris Bills. I'm a, the co-founder and senior writer of the Striker Texas, a new soccer media platform dedicated to covering all things soccer across the Lone Star State. And joining me today on today's panel are Christian Lavers, president of the Elite Clubs National League, Leslie Gallimore, commissioner of the Girls Academy, uh, when, since it was founded in 2020. Before that, she coached for, coached for 26 seasons at the University of Washington. Kaylee Collins, a uh, senior goalkeeper at USC, who is an alum of ECNL. She played at uh, Mustang in California. And then Bree Helsentegger from here in Austin, Went, uh, was came out of the Lone Star Academy and played in uh, ECNL for a year, the Girls Development Academy, and then one year in GA as well. Um, and Bree, welcome. She, she's calling in from Pittsburgh where she's a freshman. So welcome everybody and uh, thanks for joining us. I'm sorry about the weather here in Texas, both of you, uh, you know, on the ECNL and and the GA side, I'm sorry to hear that, that uh, the ECNL national event was canceled over in Houston, Christian, but hopefully, you know, we'll get better better weather. I thought it was supposed to be warm down here, but I'm wearing a sweater right now. <laughs> Can't control the weather. Yeah, same with you, Leslie. I, I, the, it looks like the uh, ATX, uh, GA ATX event is going to be able to to go, and hopefully we get better better weather next week as well. Yeah, normally I don't like yeah. turf, but it's currently saving us. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So I did want to start out uh, and and hear from the players. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about player experience on the youth youth soccer side, and both of these uh, young women had uh, unique experiences coming up through uh, the youth soccer route at, at different times in in the evolution. Um, Kaylee, Bree, and maybe Kaylee, if you want to you want to start out there in uh, beautiful California. Uh, you know, tell me about your uh, upbringing and, and how you kind of went through the, the youth soccer ranks out, out there. Well, I, as you said, I, I played growing up in Northern California for Mustang. Um, I made that transition to play in ECNL when I think I was in seventh grade. Um, and then um, had a great experience. I loved I mean, I had gone from like a really small club in my home community to playing. Um, I had to travel a little bit for my club team, but to get to training and stuff like that, but um, totally worth it. I got some great exposure through that, met some great coaches, some great people, um, and ultimately kind of got connected to play with USC. And um, yeah, since it's been, I'm in my fifth year at USC right now and have had quite the journey. Um, dealt with a lot of crazy different things, including COVID. So it's been a packed five years. Um, but yeah, now I am, I just signed, or I didn't sign, but I just got drafted by Orlando Pride. So I'm finishing out my next, um, and, I guess hopefully finishing through May 17th when the championship is, and then going to head over to Orlando after. Yeah, congratulations on getting drafted. That's a, that's an exciting moment, and usually you'd be heading heading straight to camp, but you still got a season to finish out. So that's exciting. That's exciting as well. Um, yeah. And then Bree, uh, yeah, growing up here in Austin, part of a soccer family. Uh, your your dad's a coach as well, and uh, you know came up through the same club your your whole life at Lone Star. Uh, you know what was that experience like, and, and you know tell me about your your youth soccer experience coming coming through. Um, yeah, so first I want to thank all of you guys for everything you do. But um, so whenever I was little, I joined Lone Star, and I've been with them like ever since. And I started in their junior academy and had great coaches. It was fun. And then whenever I got older for competitive, they gave me like a ton of opportunities. Like when I was 15, I was on the U19 team and I got to play on their WPSL team. And 
I've just been with them and I've decided to stay with them through it all. And I got committed to Pitt my junior year in high school. At one of the, they saw me at one of the DA showcases. And so now I'm here. I graduated high school early, a semester early to come here and train at Pitt in the spring. Yeah. Yeah, it's exciting. Uh, I know you're you're chomping at the bit to get going. You, you'd like to be playing this spring, but uh, we'll see you in the fall. Yes. And and you know, big things, big things ahead for for Bree Hills and take up, up there in Pittsburgh. But uh, you know, Christian and Leslie, you know, hearing those two experiences, and I'm sure we'll get more into them. But uh, you know, no two experiences are, are really alike in, in youth soccer. I think it's uh, you know really. Uh, you know, what are what are some of the the opportunities that that and the challenges that ECNL and NGA face being a national league? Uh, you know, creating these opportunities for for girls across the country that are all going through different experiences in different areas. Um, you know, just you know, kind of lay out the land for us of you know the 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 um, top level of, of girls youth soccer. Christian, maybe maybe you want to start. Sure, and, and I'd, I'd like to echo Bree and say thanks for having us on here and congrats to, to Bree on her commitment and upcoming career at Pitt. And Kaylee, obviously, you've had a phenomenal career and good luck moving on and finishing college. And obviously, Leslie uh, has been one of the uh, biggest figures in college women's soccer for a long time. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, when you ask about the ECNL and the national uh, landscape, I mean, one of the challenges of doing anything in a country this big is trying to make it work when there's so much different need, thought, perspective um, in different areas, whether it's geographically, culturally, economically, demographically, whatever it may be. Um, and then also trying, trying to, do, to put together programming that helps players that doesn't um, have too much cost. Uh, that's one of the biggest challenges you always have is how do you how do you create a good program that is accessible to players as you can um, and that uh, evolves as the game evolves and so obviously the last 12 months have been really unprecedented with covid but the game changes every year um, in terms of the development of players the development of clubs what's needed to make the environment better new problems that come up and so our challenge as a league is how do we continually innovate so that we make sure that our league can provide what the clubs, players, and teams want in order to have the experience they want and to accomplish the goals that they have. Yeah, uh, Leslie, uh, you know, the, the GA is, is new to this landscape, uh, came in, in in 2020, but, uh, you know, what are you guys doing so far to create a national platform that, uh, you know, is growing, uh, you know, every day by loops and bounds? Well, listening to Christian, you know, he's been at this much longer. This this league was, uh, you know, formed out of necessity when the DA dropped. So it's uh, in its first year, and it's it, it's it's female and girl centric. So we really have our eye on um, specifically making the, the 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 player, the female players' experience one that um, I talked a lot. I've talked a lot about just making sure that they get a broader vision of what they can do. Now, um, knowing that being in this game for life is something that can give them much more than a college scholarship or a youth national team um, call up and being able to put people in front of them that can show them that that's a reality. So we've worked really hard on um, the idea that the female player pathway has a uniqueness to it, not just in this country, but abroad as well, and trying to paint that picture for them all during COVID. <laughs> So new league during a pandemic, don't recommend it, but you know, if we can get through this, we can get through anything. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, so that, that's, that's been our thing is just to focus on the players and what they want and listening to their voices and empowering them as well as uh, the stakeholders in our game to have a say in, 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 as Christian mentioned, what their needs are and how you innovate, um, not to weaken what the product is, but to bring it. To make sure that you're doing things, eliminate players, don't eliminate coaches, um, don't elim leave girls out or make them an afterthought that that strengthens it and makes it more powerful. So, uh, you know, we're just plugging along, trying to to do right by the players. Yeah, and Kaylee, I want to come back to you, but it might not have felt like it when you were coming up, but uh, the landscape was actually, you know quite simpler <laughs> when you were coming through, you know, playing in the ECNL and, uh, you know, what have you kind of 
made of the changes that you've seen and also, you know, what was it like, you know, for you and, and what did those experiences of playing, you know, on a national stage, uh, you know, in these, you know, on top of your high school career, uh, you know, what did that do for your career and your recruiting and, and just, you know, what, you know, what did you, what did you experience at the ECNL level? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you make a great point. It was a lot simpler. I didn't, I didn't really experience that. Like, um, I have a, I have a younger sister actually, who's, she's playing, um, I think she's 12 now. She just turned 12. And so she's kind of like going through and playing. She's like not, um, doing super competitive stuff, but kind of like in that same, realm and it's interesting as like I hear now the like the parents and stuff talking about everything that's changing it's like um you feel it's crazy to be so like old I guess <laughs> and removed from it but um but yeah my experience I guess I guess it was different in the sense that um like everyone was in one place I guess and um you kind of knew I don't know, like you kind of knew when you went to one place, I guess there was really only, I'm excited about the opportunities that more girls have to, like Leslie was kind of saying, just like, it's not really about one, one path or one way to go through it. And I think like, even my own personal career, I feel like is a testimony to that. Like there's so many different ways um, to play soccer and do what you love. And I think that now that the structure is kind of like more to that which is like exciting to see from my perspective yeah yeah no totally and Bria, i know you had a unique experience the time that you came through um you know you were at lone star all the way through but played in a lot of different platforms a lot of different leagues and uh you know i just wonder you know as you kind of came through that pathway you know what uh you know first of all what did lone star provide to provide you that maybe stayed the same and and you know what did you what of the wrote from those experiences did you take to to think about you know what you'd kind of tell yourself uh, you know maybe a younger version of yourself about you know what you kind of want to get out of the experience of, of playing elite level youth soccer yeah so i went through all of it i went through the ecnl da and girls academy and like what mm -hmm. I learned from that is that when I was like really young, going through those like changes, I had to ask myself hard questions like, am I on the right team? Am I in the right spot? Is this the best place for me? Are other girls getting different opportunities? I'm not. And I feel like like my ideal experience would have been like maybe just one league where everybody had the same opportunities. So nobody was feeling like like left out or confused because you're so young and you're having to make these decisions while some people are telling you they're the best when other people are telling you, no, we're the best. And it's all just like a, like a conflict in your head. But like, I mean, everything happened for a reason. Like I got to where I was now, despite all of the changes, but that's how I would seem like the ideal because it just gives everybody the same opportunities, like every girl. Yeah, and I guess you know that's you know that's the challenge right now in in, in girls youth soccer. I guess is you know the fact that there are there have been multiple leagues for the, the past few years, and of course the U.S. Soccer Development Academy coming in and going away three years later. But Christian, you know, you guys at the ECNL, and I'll come back to to Leslie in a minute. But you guys at the ECNL have you know remained fairly consistent, uh, you know, as, as a high level of competition nationally since two thousand nine. Um, you know. I guess how do you sort of uh, you know take the feedback from the players and 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 try to um, you know give them something that they're that they're looking for um, you know and you know how have you you know kind of continue to deliver that? Well, I think if you go back several years, I mean, we made the argument uh, louder than anybody that this country is too big for there to be one pathway and one pyramid. And <laughs> there were people who were very forceful that if you didn't, if you didn't solely focus on soccer by age 12 and play 10 months of the year in the same club environment, that you had no path to the top level of the game, which I think is ridiculous. And so we've for a long time talked about the need and the value of different pathways for different players. And, and ultimately for players to choose 
choose what they feel is right for them. Our challenge always is to work with the clubs because clubs know their teams and their families and their community better than anybody does, whether it's me sitting in Milwaukee or somebody in Chicago or anywhere else. And so what we try and do is bring the club leadership together to talk about what they see in their environment, what they want to see change. You know, if I go back to 2009, when we first presented the concept of this thing called ECNL, it was 40 clubs in a room that were just trying to get better games for their players because they weren't getting good enough games and they weren't seeing what they wanted to see in the development landscape. Now we fast forward to uh, 119 clubs right now for next year. The player pool across the, the country has grown so much in quality and depth in the last 10, 15 years, and we've grown to accommodate that. And if you look at so many of these players that have moved on, we're really proud of the kids that have come from the ECNL and gone into college soccer and gone into the pros. But there's always going to be players that come from different paths. Our challenge is to try and create the best pathway we can and the best environment we can. And we're constantly looking to do that and improve that with the support and buy-in of the clubs and always with the question of what, what is in the player's best interest. Um, and I think that that speaks to it and the fact that there's other organizations and other platforms is a great thing because the player the player pool is growing and not never is one organization going to serve all people no matter what the field is and so no different yeah i think that's a great point and and leslie you know you you've uh spent the past 26 years until uh just recently you know seeing girls as they come out you know the other side of that youth experience and and you know into the next stage of their careers and i you know i wonder what the feedback that you've heard you know your your experiences recruiting um you know what you know what you're kind of now bringing into the youth spot, soccer space you know from from hearing from girls about their experiences uh you know once they've gone through and once they're you know mature and adults and sort of processing all of those decisions and all those things and those uh you know those experiences that they had at the youth level yeah, um, it was 26 at Washington. And it was 34 total. So uh, it, yeah. was, it was even longer than, than I can even imagine that it, looking back on it. So, you know, and, and in those 34 years to the point, not that I, you know, want to tout how long it is to hang in the college coaching, but man, did things change from year one to year 34. <laughs> so a little bit to Christian's point, this is a very large country with different needs and um, I think, you know, this country is built on competition, right? Soccer is a sport, it's competition. And I think competition drives all parties to be better, hopefully. Uh, and that's the idea. And, and again, this league currently, the, the Girls Academy, um, it has been built and it came about um, out of necessity. And how we as adults manage to um, make it less confusing. I think when we come out of COVID and, and our group has time um, to breathe, so to speak, and, and, you know, get out of survival mode and get into thri thriving mode, um, I, you know, I, I know we'll start to have converse, conversations about how all organizations can make whatever pathway um, players are in, and I'm speaking again to the girls' side, less confusing for parents, less confusing for players, and just for them to know what they're going into. And then, you know, again, if, if a league in a market or in their area suits, suits the needs of that club, um, and their vision and philosophy, then then that's great that they have options. Uh, there's nothing in my mind that's um, negative about that. My to your question about players and how over time uh, that changed. One of the biggest ones with the DA, obviously, and the one that we don't have in the GA was the high school rule. And Christian can probably speak to right. this also. The high school rule, um, was a, it was not necessarily a deal breaker. And I think there's there are certain markets where. 10 months, no high school was perfectly fine. They've built clubs around it and kids get to have a choice. As a college coach myself, I've never once in my entire career told a player not to play high school if it's what she wanted to do. Uh, if, if, if that's, I just, I think anytime you take a choice away from a player, it's not good, <laughs> you know? And, and again, I think mm -hmm. that adults, um, we all too often think we know what's best and we don't listen to what they want. And the conversations I've had over the years about high school soccer um, sometimes have led for, to players on a certain pathway and at a certain level to decide not to play. But I know they felt comfortable not playing because it was their choice. Uh, and I, I've said, is it, is it fun? Are you in an environment where you're, you know, 
enjoying yourself, your leadership skills are different than they are in your, your club or your academy, uh, just asking them the questions and leading them down the path of making a decision for themselves. And uh, I, I think that that's the conversation that revolved a lot around recruiting is the environment they were in. And at the end of the day, um, you know, the coaching that you're getting, the environment that you're learning in, the type of, you know, training you're getting around the game and who you are yourself and what you're putting into it, it's what's going to make you a great player or, or one that maybe doesn't rise to the level that you think you should. That So, you know, it's it's that, it's not the label that, that's going to make the ultimate difference. And again, I think sometimes, uh, and definitely that's what's just in this day and age is um, how much information people get quickly and how it, it changes their perception of what they're actually deciding on in some cases. So I think that's that's been the evolution I've seen. And uh, I, I just really have always been the same from my perspective of making sure that girls that want to grow up and be uh, college players, girls that want to try to make the national team, young women that want to try to be professionals, that they understand what their choices are at every step of their pathway so that they, they have an educated choice to make. Yeah, and, and you you mentioned competition sort of at the front. I want to come back to that, but the, the high school point, I thought you you did. I want to touch on that as well. And, and Kaylee and Bree, you both had different experiences there. Kaylee, you played four years of high school soccer. And, you know, I wonder, you know, what that brought to your experience, and and you know, what some of the, you know, what what that add. I, I guess what that added to your experience coming up through uh, youth soccer, and and you know whether you think that you know that, you know, what you heard from girls kind of coming up behind you that they didn't have that experience. Yeah, I think like to Leslie's point, she brought up some great things I think that I can totally relate to about like just the choice in general of like, I think so often um, in sports in general, there's this like flow that everyone feels like we kind of have to go along. Like I have to get recruited at this time. I have to like, play for the national team at this time, I have to get invited to this and this. And like, just one thing that I've really, like that really resonates with me is that all of the kind of like choices that I've had to make have kind of been what, if I hadn't had to make those choices, I don't know if I would love soccer the same way. I think each mm -hmm. opportunity for me to validate like, okay, I'm the one who has agency here. I'm the one who's deciding to come back and play another season, to stay here with my team and not go, for, like all of these things. Um, so I think to to bring it back to the question, like just being able to have that opportunity to be the one to say, okay, I find, it's also about learning what's like valuable to you. Like I, I find the high school soccer experience valuable, so I'm going to choose to do it. Um, and that's like, I think all of these choices are opportunities to really figure out not just as athletes, but as humans, like what's, um, what do you really value? So for me, long winded way to say, um, yeah. I think the high school experience was so important to me because I really found out that it was about the people and the relationships that I really like, what really made me love soccer. And, um, I, looking back, like, I honestly didn't think about it until you asked, but, like, I don't know if I would have come to that conclusion so quickly and so um, with so much clarity had I not had that high school soccer experience. Because it's not really about, I mean, like, some certain clubs or certain high schools are probably more competitive than others, but um, in my eyes, high school soccer is about playing playing with your, your friends that you get to go to school with every day and, like, having your classmates come out and watch you. So, um, yeah, I, I couldn't imagine not having that opportunity to play, um, but I do know that it's different now. And, and I have, I have, don't know much about, um, the ones who haven't, who haven't, who've decided to not. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, Bree, uh, you know, you came up as well and, 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 um, the high school role or the the DA kind of came in right as you were going in into high school. Uh, I know your your dad is a longtime high school uh, boys coach, uh, but 
you know, for you, why do you think that the high school soccer has remained such an important part of uh, the girls' landscape and, uh, you know, you and your teammates, uh, you know, having to go through that, you know, why do you think that is, that, you know, even though club soccer is where a lot of the recruiting and the high competition happens, you know, why is high school soccer remain so important on, on the girls' uh, side of things? Um, so, yeah, um, DA came, like, right whenever I was going, like, my freshman year. And then I'm pretty sure, because I, I was trying to decide, like, to, like I want to play high school, but I couldn't because I didn't have many choices. Like, I don't think Sting was ECNL to my junior year or something like that. And I was already committed by then. But I was, it was really hard because... I could just, like, I go to school every day and, like, you see their posters up, like, the high school team, and I'm like, I just can't play. And then I just think high school brings opportunities, like, playing with different people, being coached by different coaches, different competition. You can win awards and everything. And I feel like it would be fun because my friends were on the soccer team, and I felt like, you know, it's just a different environment. And I feel like it would be fun and I never got that chance, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's kind of, kind of crazy to think because nobody at my school even knew I like played soccer until I committed and like signed and they're like, what? You play soccer? And it's kind of just weird to think about <laughs> because it's like they would all know if I was playing and like people would come watch and stuff like that. And it was it made it really hard, especially since my dad was a high school coach, like a boys high school coach when I was little. And I just grew, like grew up around that. and. They're like all family. They still talk to this day, and he like some of them went really far, and it's just something I feel like I really missed out on, and I think it's important because because Kaylee said like that's how she found out she like really loved it, like stuff like that. Like I wonder if my whole journey would be different, like how different would it be if I got to play? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's. Uh... It's so interesting, you know, hearing hearing that feedback from from players, and I, you know, I wonder, you know, Christian, you guys have been able to make that work at ECNL of having, you know, clubs make their own decisions on whether, you know, players play high school or not, and obviously GA is taking that route moving forward as well. But how has that worked in states like California and Texas, where the high school seasons might be different than, you know, other areas of the country uh, where it's not that way? You know, how have you guys? handled that and, and, you know, kept girls playing high school soccer since, you know, over, over the years? Well, the starting point um, is that I think there's 13 or 14 different girls high school seasons across the country. And our starting point was to allow a competition to be structured in a way that players did not have to quit high school soccer in order to play in the ECNL. We could schedule around that. Then the second piece to that was, and, and I, I agree 100% with what people have said here, it's an incredibly personal decision. Every player needs to find the environment for them to maximize their own potential. And for some players, that includes high school soccer. For some players, it doesn't. For some players, it's a mix of playing a couple of years and not other years. And ultimately, we don't feel that there should be pressure on a player to do either. They shouldn't feel an obligation to play for their school and any in the same way that just because you play an instrument, you don't have to be in the band and they should not be pressured not to play uh, because somebody tells them there's no pathway. And so what we try to do is leave that decision in the hands of the clubs. And then I think the clubs generally have left that decision in the hands of the players and most clubs around the country now that are competing at higher levels have a group of players that choose not to play high school soccer by their own volition and up a group of players that right. choose two. I've coached kids uh, kids at the time that have gone in and played professionally in the NWSL, some of whom never played high school soccer and some of whom played three or four years of high school soccer. And so it just goes back to, there is no magic wand. At the end of the day, what our job is, is to create the best environment we can, an environment that makes people, that challenges and tests them, um, and that allows them to chart their own path because leagues don't develop players, Clubs develop players to some degree, but ultimately players develop players. And I think that's the most important thing in this. And it's our job to inspire them and create an environment where the clubs can help the players find that path for themselves. Yeah, and, and Leslie, uh, you know, I know that uh, GA was kind of founded on this idea of, of listening more to the players and not, you know, kind of talking over them or talking down 
down to them. Uh, you know, I wonder, you know, what lessons have been learned uh, from through that process, uh, through the, the Girls Academy Advisory Panel that have sort of shaped the vision and, and uh, you know, where things are sort of headed uh, with with Girls Academy. And what, you know, what you've heard from the players and how much work still needs to be done to, to implement, uh, you know, those things that you're hearing. And, and I want to hear from, from Kaylee and Bree about, you know, what they, what they sort of think about, um, you know, what their feedback is from, from their own experiences. Um, I think that the, the main thing has been for them to have a, a safe space and adult leadership with them to be able to have conversations about everything. Um, about their pathway, about what's happening in the world right now. Um, one of the, the biggest things that, that has come out of the advisory panel um, early on, especially, was just this idea of um, connecting a big country and being able to have conversations with people all over the U.S. that are in the you know different places, different culture, different environment, but all uniting around the game of soccer and the, the game of girls' youth soccer and what their different shared experiences are and how they can kind of increase their pool of shared experiences, if you will. Uh, I think, you know, I, I believe that um, there's oftentimes that with, with young adults and, and, and players that we um, make assumptions um, that we know best. And, you know, with experience, we probably should and know how to make good decisions. But you'd be really, really surprised at how many great ideas come from, mm -hmm. from them. Um, and, you know, just again about their own pathway and their own experience. Uh, there's been a lot of different, you know, kind of initiatives and ideas. Obviously, last summer and the, a lot of the unrest and the movement and social justice platforms have been uh, a talking point. Um, diversity, inclusion, uh, how we, uh, a soccer landscape that looks different than even this screen right here looks. Um, and, and make sure that, uh, you know, that we're, we're doing things um, from leadership positions that uh, help that. And uh, so, you know, I could, I could go on and on. It's, again, survival mode to thriving mode is, is where we are right now. And I just think we've scratched the, the surface on what this group is going to help us do in the league. And it's young people give me hope. Let's put it that way. And I, I just think there's a lot of things that, um, when you put other women in front of girls who have shared um, what they have done, what they want to do, and they can share those experiences back with them in real time and in real life and be in front of them and show them what they've gone off to do to be owners of teams and GMs and commissioners and um, broadcasters and referees. And I, then I, I just think they start to see that it's possible for them and how they can be in the game for life as just as opposed to just being in it as a player for now just to give them again that broader vision of what the game can give them so it's a uh, you know it's an ongoing process and i really want to give kudos to the adult leaders in our group that have uh taken this on and really they will tell you grown from it more than the players have probably and the trickle down effect yeah. of empowerment and leadership is something that I can't wait to wake up to in 10 years and watch what some of these women have done. It, I have high hopes it'll be remarkable. Yeah, and I guess uh, Kaylee Bree hearing that and, and uh, you know, also sitting um, here getting talked to two of the, the leaders in, in girls youth soccer, like, uh, you know, what would you say to, to players that, you know, are able to make these choices now that, that you know, are, hearing their voice being listened to a little bit more, what would you express to, to girls kind of going through this system of, you know, how to use that voice or, you know, where you feel like you could have used a, you know, a voice if, if you, you know, if you feel like you, you know, you didn't have as much of one in, in your experience. Yeah. I, I mean, two things that Leslie said in, um, in there about like one the first piece about the um, opportunity that that we've had I think as older players to kind of like or as a sport I guess in general to kind of like use our voice and kind of like tap into um, more social justice movements not only has that been huge I mean like personally on on my team I think we have giving 
having a uh, black male coach, he has made it a priority for our team to like have these conversations. Um, and even looking back, I look at 2016 when I registered in my freshman year, that 2016 season, and we won a national championship. We had, um, I think there were probably four or five girls who kneeled for the national anthem in 2016. Um, and at that time, that was kind of um, like it was just happening. Everything was just starting. And we had the opportunity to sit down as a team and get into a classroom and talk about how people felt about it. And you heard everything. Um, and as a freshman, I think that was like the craziest, also scary experience for me to be sitting there and like to be hearing these mature women who have who have things to say about um, about social movements and about um, what we were going to do as a team. But having that opportunity to come together and decide, um, like we know that certain people feel one way and certain people feel the other, but what do we feel as a team? Like, what are we gonna do? Um, having the opportunity to make that decision together was something I will never forget. And it is something that I think really speaks a lot about what sports and what women's soccer gives people. Um, so to Leslie's point, like opening that up on the youth level it would be incredible. I think like I was shocked when I got into um, when I got into college about just like how much I how much I could do and how much my voice did matter and um, how much the voices of the people around me mattered. So like to open that up to a, a youth level and to instill that from a young age would be so valuable. And I think to see, to your point about like, what would we want to see more of? Um, I think like having a little bit more connection between the college players and the youth players, um, like what we were saying before, for, for these women to see, it's not just like for youth players, they, they look up to like, Alex Morgan's the national like all the national team players you know um for them to see a more like not only diverse but also a younger and just like different people that look different people that have had different paths people that aren't like maybe not stars you know um to see all of the opportunities even at a college level I think would be great so like connecting I guess the college players to the youth players um I don't know if I actually answered your question there, but those are just some thoughts I had. No, those are those are great thoughts, and uh, you know, I I, I guess um, you know, Bree, I don't know if you have anything to add on, you know, maybe what you'd tell your younger self or you know somebody uh, who's got that opportunity. I know you know the girls at Lone Star have have started to to be on that the, that advisory panel and and things like that. So. Um, you know, I guess what, what 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 do you have to add to to what what Kaylee just shared? Well, I just have like a little bit to add. I feel like I would tell myself like, don't be afraid to speak up or say that thing, and because like right now, I w I can think back at some points where I'm like, I wish I said something or like stood up for myself there or stood up for that person there. So like, just like don't be afraid to say something because. Like if it's the right thing and you think it's the right thing to do, like just just do it and before you like regret it because I wish I would have said some things or stood up for myself back then. Yeah, and and Christian, you know, listening to to both of these two, uh, you know, speak about their experiences and and their thoughts. Uh, you know, I know that you've got such a deep and um, storied kind of alumni base, and you've started to to allow you know some of those players to to speak on you know the national platform with the podcast and things like that but also you know clubs individual clubs uh, you know having their players you know what, what what do you think that you know how how have you seen the the longevity of the ecnl uh these clubs and the places that these players have taken their careers you know being passed down to the younger generations and how's that empowering this this younger crop of, of players uh that you've seen in the ecnl well, I think, and this goes back even prior to when Kaylee and Bree were playing, but if you go back to 2009, most clubs in this country were 
really collections of teams and what the under 18 team was doing and the under 14 team was completely different. And there was very little connection from age group to age group in most clubs. And part of that was just based around the landscape that existed at that time and, and the structure of the way the game was. So if you fast forward now to the far more integrated development path that most clubs have and the fact that the U14s are traveling with the U18s a lot and they're seeing them play and then it's easy to move players up and down. I mean, I'll go to 2004, 2005. I mean, you needed written permission from organizations to play a player up in age group because you had to go through all sorts of new paperwork. And so now you can move players around all the time. So I, I use that as just one very small example that of how the games changed that most people now don't even know it used to be that way. Um, now you look at our alumni base and I, you know, the stats are unbelievable because the players have done so well. I mean, 90% of the, the players in the ECNL have gone on to college soccer. I mean, that's incredible. Um, I, I don't know that there's numbers like that in any sport anywhere. And that speaks to what these girls are doing. But each time that happens, that's one more role model that comes back into a club. Somebody who's done something that maybe hasn't been done at that club. And I think that it's so difficult to do something the first time. The second and the third and the fourth time is so much easier. People just need to see it to believe it. And I think we've seen that with players going into the NWSL, into the national teams, but even beyond that, so many of these players after college and when they're done playing, there's a lot going into coaching and staying involved in the game, but they're doing so many other things now. They're doctors, they're lawyers, they're business people. And we really believe in the holistic value of sport and if we can make soccer better in on the soccer field and in the experience, not only does it lead to better soccer outcomes, but it leads to better life outcomes and people who learn how to achieve. And I think that's hopefully when we look back, that's one of the uh, one of the outcomes of, of the league doing a better job and working with clubs and working with players to make it a better experience. And uh, I think that will continue to grow. And we're continuing to build more and more programs for young players to play up, for young players to have more experience with older players, even in the club environment. That's what our Super Cup is about. But at the same time, playing up isn't a magic elixir. There, there's a real value to playing in your own age group. You know, just like uh, diversity of experience creates a better player. And so I think we have to keep that in mind when we create league platforms, when we create club platforms, and when we work with people. Yeah. And I mentioned uh, competition. I wanted to circle back to that. I think, you know, as people look at the landscape now um, and, you know, the number of top clubs, that obviously, you know, the depth um, in ECNL, but also, you know, some of the top clubs in the, in the country are in the GA. I wonder you know, what it would take or how far we are from, from seeing a little bit more cross competition and what some of the, the challenges, uh, you know, are toward making that happen and if there are benefits uh, to it, I guess. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we have never prohibited cross competition. Again, that was a DA rule. Um, there's value in competition all the time. There's real challenges in sometimes in terms of weekends available there's challenges in terms of number of games and training. And we'd be naive to say, and this is, this is an adult problem, but there are times when people just don't get along and club A doesn't want to play club B for one reason or another. Sometimes there might be good reasons for that, other times there's not. But at the end of the day, the more competition, the better. Competition proves the, the best. And I think that's really important. We can't sit and say competition is good between players and a roster but it's not good between pathways. And that's why I've always been against monolithic structures. I think it's really important that you're always driven. If you look through history, so much of people who have achieved were pushed by somebody else who made them better. And I think that's also what we're trying to build within our own platform within the regional league is a proving ground and pathway so that clubs can win on the field with development and performance and results and have a way to reach the top level within our pyramid. Because this is not about anointing clubs. This is not about creating walls of marketing. This is about using competition to develop
develop players, to develop clubs, to develop coaches, and ultimately make a better environment. And to do that, there needs to be transparency. To do that, there needs to be access. And to do that, people need to feel the pressure of competition. And so we are 100% behind that. And to the degree interplay uh, is possible, we always support that. We've never told a club not to play anybody at any time. Yeah, I guess you hear that, Leslie. Uh, you know, Christian wants to be be pushed. Uh, I know you guys are, you know, trying to push and, and get better. And I know, you know, that's a, uh, I think we talked over the summer and you said, you know, that's, you know, it's a long-term process, but what do you hear, you know, what do you think of uh, the idea of, of cross competition and also, you know, what you're doing to, to grow um, the membership and to grow the level of, of GA, uh, you know, to match yeah, and, and to, compete? Yeah, just to what Christian just said, there's already, I mean, there's <laughs> the point that's stuck with me is his, <laughs> when he said there's people that just don't like each other. Um, it kind of made me giggle. It is a, it is an adult problem um, because there are plenty of teams um, in the GA currently and in the ECNL that play friendlies all the time. They've happened already this year, even during the pandemic. I mean, those are the adults that I want to be friends with because they're the ones that are putting players first and saying, let's get competition, let's get games. <laughs> so um, hopefully that, that happens more and more. I've just um, still have a few more to go, but sat through uh 65 i think we're on now um club interviews and 45 minutes each why my voice is a little raspy to be honest uh and the, the i knew that i'm new to this on this side of things you know and we're a new league again out of necessity but i i came into this with the idea that there were seven thousand kids girls that were sort of left behind and um with with without a place to go um, and I felt, you know, I didn't really want to come out of retirement as soon as I did, but I, I felt a passion about having an impact in any way I could to sort of rescue their playing experience. And it's been um, a labor of love on a lot of people's part to, to get this to where it is now. And I'm um, exhausted yet excited every day about where it can go and, you know, nothing worth it is ever, ever easy. Um, so building this thing the right way, the way we want to with our mission and vision and I don't say right way because I think there's a right and a wrong. I think the we want we want to be the best us, and I tell players this all the time. Like comparison is the thief of joy. Sometimes it's just be you and be the best you you can be, and don't always be looking around to see what it is that everyone else is doing. So um, you know, competitors have to keep their eye on each other, but at the same time, you take your eye off yourself, you you're in trouble. I think as any entity. So we're working really hard to. Um, you know, make sure that the vision and mission of clubs that we add are as aligned as possible. Um, if there's anything that, that I think it needs help and development, I, I'm certainly one that uh, has offered that to clubs where I feel like they might have gaps um, in, their, in their sort of processes or systems or uh, ways that they go about things. So I, I, I hope to make soccer better by helping coaches and directors um, and educating them and providing opportunities for them to see what the best do um, in every single aspect. So, uh, you know, again, month, whatever we're in now, 10, 10 or coming up on, I think is um, to be seen, but there's never going to be a time where we won't want to just play games against whoever wants to play them. And it's a scheduling issue. You have enough scheduling and field space problems yeah. <laughs> in this country as it is with trying to fit other competitions and isn't I'm learning isn't the easiest that Christian alluded to it isn't the easiest thing on earth but um, I, I think the easiest way it, it again friendlies are the best way to do it it's still a game right it doesn't have to necessarily you know there's video and if the pandemic's taught us anything video um, college coaches right. scouts whoever can be seen by are, are able to watch games now and, and see the competitions or practice or training technology is is helping with that so uh you know i just I, I hope again that i refer to the adults in the room a lot that adults start to um gear their decisions um away from themselves and, and towards players when it comes to their decision making yeah for sure and i i guess uh kelly and and brie um when you hear uh, you know when you think about the the these national leagues and your experiences coming up through them. Uh, you know, Kelly talked about her high school experiences as well. Um, you know, just the amount of travel that goes into that. Um, you know, 
how much did you enjoy getting to sort of travel and see the country and, and be at these big showcases? And, you know, how much of it did you feel like was, you know, you could have done regionally playing more, more local competition? Uh, you know, how many, how many weekends do you think you spent on the road and, and you know, how much did you, you know, what were the, the benefits and drawbacks of, of that experience? Well, I mean, I loved, I, th I thought the travel part of my youth experience was great. I think it was just like being able to do that with my teammates. It's a great, um, it was a great, like great precursor to what college was going to be like. And um, yeah, that's when I, like, I, I think back to high school and some of my best experiences and my best memories are from going to different places with my team. And I was actually thinking about this um, this morning. I was talking to my mom about me going to Florida and um, we were talking about the fact that I've never been outside. I've never lived outside of the West Coast. And I kind of forget that had it not been for soccer, had it not been for um, even not just college, but ECNL, I, I don't think I would have gone anywhere within the US, which is kind of crazy to me. Um, but yeah, it's just another opportunity that soccer gives, um, I think in the U S in general, like we don't travel as much as other countries and, um, to travel within our own country, like each state has like their own culture, you know? So to have those experiences yeah. just from a person aspect, I think is really, really valuable. Um, but yeah, to your point, like there, there are definitely drawbacks. There's like, a lot of your identity gets caught up in um, time, time that takes to get to each place. And I think um, in high school, there should be a little bit more, like if we're going to have these, um, all this travel where you're going and taking the time, like you're leaving school early, those kinds of things, um, there should be a huge emphasis on the fact that you're traveling and it's not just about soccer, um, but you're getting to experience the cultures. So um, if you can like see what I'm saying about like the balance between if you're gonna take away the opportunity to like be in school and um, develop other parts of your identity to make up for it um, in, in the ways of like learning thing, new things on the road and about different cultures and stuff. Yeah, no, I think that's really, really well said. And, and you know, I guess uh, Bree being here in Texas and, you know, traveling you know, sometimes as far as, uh, you know, Kansas City, you know, on, on weekends and things like that. Um, you know, what did you take away from your, your experience, uh, you know, getting to see the country and play soccer and, uh, you know, be seen and, and get recruited to, to Pittsburgh, a program like Pittsburgh? Um, yeah, we traveled a lot and I enjoyed it because you get to see so many different places. And, um, but it was sometimes it was really, really hard because it was like sometimes it was like back to back to back to back weekends of you're on a plane or you're driving 12 hours or something like that and it was kind of a sacrifice to make because maybe you're like I'm get I have to miss this high school football game or I can't um, hang out with my friends that we had planned anymore and that's more of like the social aspect but of course like you have to sacrifice some of that stuff to get to where you want to be and but yeah, I mean, it was nice to see different places and obviously traveling. I got seen in Denver, like at a showcase, like it, it turned out to be good for me because now I'm where I am. But um, it was sometimes hard to think like we, one time we had to like travel to Michigan to play. And I was like, yeah. this is, it's like weird to think about because there's like solar FC Dallas, Sting, Dallas Texans, they're like like next to us but like let's say like we have to go like fly to california and they have to fly to florida the same weekend and play different teams when we could drive like like a few hours maybe to play each other but like some like, like that's like just an example of like sometimes what i think about is like i wonder like like why can't we just play them if they're right there but also it's you're traveling to get different competition so it's like I, i'm like I like it, but sometimes I'm like, I want to see what it would be like to just stay home sometimes. But yeah. Yeah, no. I and mean, if COVID's taught us anything, it's, you know, how to, to work around those travel restrictions. And I wonder, you know, Leslie and Christian, you know, what you guys have learned about, you know, 
playing more regional matches or, you know, how, how you've kind of worked around COVID and what things might kind of stick around, uh, you know, once we, once we keep, uh, you know, get past, um, you know, once the vaccines are out. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief on this because Christian's been at this a lot longer, but as it relates to Mm. COVID and the number of markets that have been pretty much closed and the ones that have never closed and been open and kids have been able to play. I mean, I think from the get-go, youth sports have said this is going to teach the lesson of less travel, which will reduce costs, which will make sports more um, feasible for more kids and more inclusive. So that's that's the biggest takeaway for me and how we build towards that is certainly going to be part of the strategy. with national showcases and competitions um, and friendlies making more sense, you know, financially, but also figuring out in the calendar how many of those travel trips and and flights that you realistically need to take to be seen by coaches on different parts of the country, play against different competition that you don't normally see. There's a balance for sure. And we'll build out that way as best we can. Christian. Yeah. I think if you were to look at our map from five years ago or seven years ago to now, you see a lot more points of light um, and that's reflective of the balance of travel. I mean, we believe if you're going to, if you're going to go spend time on an airplane uh, or several nights at a hotel, there needs to be a really big reward to that. Uh, And a national showcase in front of, you know, 500 colleges is, uh, is a pretty big reward for that. But doing that for a conference game um, probably is, is time that could be spent elsewhere and ultimate ultimately, um, it also creates a, a more vibrant competition when you have people that can play each other without spending so much time in the car and kids can do other things. I think the last thing I'd say about that is, you know, one of the reasons we, we launched the Super Cup for this fall um, is ultimately if you want better competition, there's one way to do it without going anywhere. And that's just play older. And again, there's not there's not uh, it's not the answer for every player all the time. But to have kids that are challenged in training in periodic competition with older players is one way that you can spur development and make things a lot better without getting on a plane or without driving several hours. At the same time, and I think Kaylee and Bree both hit it, there is fun, there is fun things with travel. There's educational things with travel. I mean, if we take a top Texas team, a top California team, that's a game a lot of people are going to want to watch. So there is need for it. And especially the higher you go on a pyramid, you should travel because that's where the competition is, not travel just to travel and not travel because you feel like you need to fly all over the country and be the greatest 14 year old team in the history of soccer. So I think it's a balance of everything and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, and uh, you know, just a few minutes left here, but, but Kaylee, you know, you mentioned at the top getting drafted. Uh, you know, by the Orlando Pride. And, and, you know, I wonder how much time you've taken to kind of reflect on, you know, your your whole whole soccer experience, but especially how your youth soccer experience kind of led you to, to today. Um, and, you know, again, what advice you might have for those younger girls that are aspiring to, to one day reach that goal of, of going pro. I think just to like kind of bring everything together, like one of the things I thought was really cool, Orlando sent me this like, um, player development kind of thing. And it was, I had to like rank myself on a, a, a couple scales and some of them were technical. Some of them about, were about leadership and all these things. But one of them said, um, I had to rank myself on uniqueness. And I thought that was so like, that totally stood out to me. And I think it, I think it's a great thing to fit in here um, about how, who you are as a player and what you bring and how unique your experience is. Like all of these decisions that we've talked about over the past hour, um, they've turned me into the player that I am and the person that I am. And at the pro level and the higher you get up, like it is really just more about who you are and what you can bring that's unique and different. Um, so I think that, yeah, like when I reflect back on on all of the like setbacks or um different choices that I've had to make. They're really just opportunities, you know, to like have some agency and kind of mold who I was going to be when I, when I got to this level. And, um, and I'm so grateful for that. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's been great to hear about all of your experiences and the things that, that ECNL and and GA are, are doing to, to kind of, uh, 
you know, better the, the landscape and, and continue to drive girls soccer and women's soccer forward, um, you know, for Christian Lavers, uh, president of, of ECNL, uh, Leslie Gallimore, the commissioner of Girls Academy, Kayla Collins, a senior goalkeeper at, at USC, uh, and uh, future Orlando Pride or current, you know, Orlando Pride draftee and, and Bree Hills and Tugger, who's starting out her, her college career at Pittsburgh. Thank you all for, for so much for, for joining us uh, on the Texas Soccer Summit. Thanks for having us, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And if you uh, have been following along, thank you so much for, for paying attention to what we've been doing with these panels uh, all week long for the Texas Soccer Summit presented by the, uh, the Striker Texas. Uh, our next panel up is going to be technology's role in improving players' performance with Victor Ariza, uh, my colleague down in, in Houston, uh, hosting and representatives from Austin FC, Houston Dash, and, and Texas Tech kind of talking about uh, technology and its role uh, and how things mo are moving along there. Um, but again, my name is Chris Bills, co-founder and senior writer for the Striker Texas, and this is the Texas Soccer Summit. Thanks so much for for joining us, and uh, you know, hope you hope everybody has has a great week and, and and is able to check out more more of our panels.